Welcome to the Youth Leadership Council's global webinar hosted by the Global Fund for Children, a non-profit organization that partners with community leaders from all over the world to ensure that all children and young people are safe, strong, and valued. My name is Mete Koban. I'm the chair of the Youth Leadership Council and a member of the board for GFC. The Youth Leadership Council serves an advisory committee to the organization to help develop youth-led policies and make sure that young people are at the heart of the organization. We set up the Youth Leadership Council over a year ago now, and we are very proud to have eight members from four or five different continents around the world, making sure that young people's voices are heard. And hopefully today is the start of a new series uh, that we're gonna be engaging with, with hundreds of people from around the world. So today we'll discuss the impact of COVID-19 on children, young people across the world, and we'll hear from four GFC partners from Kenya, Moldova, Mexico, and India. But I'd firstly like to start by thanking you for tuning in for today's global webinar. We're excited to be joined by over 500 participants from around the world. We want you to be part of this conversation. So please follow at global for children on Twitter, and that's a four with the number four. We'll be following this for live questions and comments. At the bottom of your screen, you'll also see a chat box. Since this is a truly global conversation, please let us know what city you're calling in from and then we can then read it out. But before we start, what I wanted to do is I wanted to take you through a few of the ground rules about how this all operates. So number one, on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a raise your hand option. Throughout this event, you'll have the opportunity to make your own comments or ask questions to the panelists. In order to conduct this in a fair way and to allow everyone the opportunity to speak, you'll need to indicate by clicking the raise your hand function. I will then call your name to unmute your speaker. Number two, you'll also see a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you prefer to not speak and to write your question, you could type your question throughout the Q&A function on your screen. I will then choose which questions to ask to the panelists. And number three, the most exciting part and the bit I love most, which we're practicing democracy in action by giving you the opportunity to vote throughout the event. This will pop up on your screen when I indicate and we, you just need to vote. So as we wait for folks to trickle in, we want to hear from, from you on the line. What do you believe worries children and youth most about COVID-19? The, the poll should pop up on your screen. As we are doing that, I wanna go on to our speakers and start introducing them and really to gauge their thoughts. So when you see the poll on your screen, you'll vote and that will simply turn off um, after you've voted. Um, and you have options of mental health, education, global economy, displacement, child abuse, physical well-being, and FGM child marriage. Um, we're joined by Douglas Mwangi from Kenya, representing Oasis. How are you, Douglas? Hi, hi, Mitch. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. And we're joined uh, also by Sutta, uh, joining us from in India, representing the Her Choices Foundation. How are you, Sita? I'm good, Douglas. I'm good, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from India. We're also joined by Paulina, calling in very early morning from Mexico. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I believe it's 7 a.m. there. I might be mistaken. And you're representing Espacio Migrante. Yes, thank you so much. And good morning from this side of the world. Thank you. And, and lastly, we're joined by Tatiana, in Moldova, representing the Institute for Rural Initiatives. Hi, Tatiana. Hi, hi, hi from Moldova. Warm hi, and um, I'm absolutely excited to be today with you here. That's great. Well, look, listen, we still got some time to, to vote on your polls. Uh, before we do get the event kicked off, I do want to gauge the views of some of our panelists. Um, you all work with young people in many different ways, and you know you've all seen the poll as well. So, Paulina, if I can come to you first. From your experience of working with children and young people in, your, in, your, in Mexico, which one of those issues do you think will be chosen as the highest? I think um, I, I already clicked off on the poll, but I think um, personal security or personal safety. Personal security, personal safety. Physical safety. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Douglas, what about you? What do you think will be the highest concern to, to young people from Kenya? Uh, definitely, it's education, and that is what I actually voted for. Perfect. 
So tell and what about you from India? So uh, the concern here would be the child marriage. Child marriage. Yeah. And Tatiana? It's education and social instability. Great. Guys, don't feel afraid to talk. Uh, you don't have to just give one word answers. If you feel to, <laughs> you'd like to give more answers, uh, we'll do that. But we'll come to um, our first questions. Thank you so much for your input. Uh, before jumping in, um, I wanted to, you know, take a moment for, you know, remembering what's happening around the world. You know, we are have, you know, I mean, this year, what has happened in 2020, um, it's been quite a challenging year since we've obviously entered the coronavirus pandemic. And of course, what's happening right now um, in the USA and the big question marks it raises around, you know, race equality and racial justice around the world. And, you know, we've lost many lives and not just now, and this is an ongoing issue. So I wanted to take this as an opportunity on behalf of the Youth Leadership Council to really recognize that and hold a minute of silence. So if you could just bear with us for a minute whilst we hold silent to pay respect to all those who've lost their lives. Thank you, thank you so much for for your um, for understanding and for that. You know, we hope that you know these uh, these days will be long behind us. You know, we we know it's an ongoing struggle and it's something that unfortunately um, is a big sort of stain on the humanity. And hopefully, uh, this is something that you know we can bring some positivity to this conversation through the panelists that we have. So here's the the bit of the we're gonna um, the, the seminar that I, I guess I've been really waiting for is is, is really to understand from all of you about how your work has been impacted uh, from the context. So I've got a couple of questions to kick us off. And uh, Paulina, I wanted to come to you first. Um, how, is, how are children and young people in the communities that you work with uh, being impacted? And are there any examples you can share with us about what your typical day looked like before the coronavirus pandemic and now? Thank you, Mitt. Yes, so in Espacio Inmigrante, we, uh, we work with immigrant families. Uh, there's a lot of asylum seekers because in the last couple of years, cities like Tijuana that we are in the border between uh, the U.S. and Mexico, uh, they have become like big waiting rooms for hundreds of families. So a typical day before the coronavirus uh, was for these families was uh, living in shelters such as Espacio Migrante and waiting for months uh, for their turn to seek asylum in the U.S. Now with the pandemic, the border has been closed indefinitely, so this means more uncertainty for these families. Uh, the children that are in Espacio Migrante, um, they are safe in, in a shelter. However, there are hundreds of, of families that don't have a shelter right now, as well as uh, many young people from Central America, countries in, throughout Latin America, the Caribbean and Africa even. And they are arriving to Tijuana to seek asylum in the U.S., but now they find, they find all the shelters are closed and uh, they're, they're having trouble finding even uh, basic housing and, and um, being able to meet their basic needs. So I think uh, it's a very hard time for these children and their families and for young people at the U.S.-Mexico border. Thank you, Paulina. I think it's. Uh, I think I can speak for everyone on this school when I say, it's. You know, we, we appreciate your work um, that you do, and you know, it's very difficult um, circumstances. And obviously, our thoughts and prayers are with all of those um, children who are obviously going through those difficult times. Um, Tatiana, I want to come to you next in in Moldova because I know, of course, you work quite a lot in in, in rural communities, and really. Um, I wanted to get a better understanding of, of what's been the impact of, of your, for your work. Um, Tatiana, I believe you're, you're on mute, so you just need to yeah. there go. There we go. Yes, absolutely. Definitely our activity as an organization were impacted. You know, um, all of us, we unexpected uh, that uh, this pandemic will affect us. 
even we didn't uh, uh, realize all dimension of the impact. And um, I, as, uh, as I remember this first week, then you realized you will work, how you will work because uh, oh, I, uh, everything stopped and you have to work now from home and how you will do this, you, your thoughts uh, come to your community and you are thinking how, do you, how you will work with your communities. And um, this is the shock. Um, what we learned that we <laughs> should not be afraid to be shocked. But the important point is what we, uh, how we can um, like calm down ourselves and think construct constructively what we, what we can do to help our organization to work and to uh, answer to the community's community needs because it was uh, about our communities and how we can make can assist our communities and um, so after uh, i think a week of long discussions we started to like to meet in zoom to plan to learn to plan in zoom uh, and to um, be uh, each like moment with our communities like all our um, all our action was direct on uh, how to reconstruct our teamwork to be the most efficient in this hard time in rural areas in our communities together with our initiative groups together with people there thank you very much tatiana i think uh it's great as well, like the diversity, you know, of um, the panelists we have here today, you know, to be able to speak about many different regions, but also the types of people that you work with. And uh, thank you again for, for the work that you're doing. Uh, so, Tara, I want to come to you next in, in India and get a really better understanding of what the situation is in India. And also, what does your, you know, what has your day looked like before and after the pandemic? And what are some of the biggest challenges that uh, have been for your organization? Yeah, uh, so before coronavirus, it was uh, our, uh, the, uh, the work we do involved usually monitoring the programs on ground, coordinating with our partners, etc. Now with the team dispersed after Corona, we had all had to shift and work from home. That has been a big uh, the, the starting. Uh, uh, we had trouble with that. But uh, luckily, we were able to start off with the uh, daily meetings and that helped us keep on track. And uh, on the other side, we had to stop all the community programs because of the intensive, like, uh, it was a high touch community programs and there was a lockdown and we weren't able to go into the community. But uh, uh, one week down the line, we understood that we cannot stop ourselves from going onto the ground because the need is even more higher now. And uh, we started uh, uh, changing, uh, adapting our programs in such a way that we, uh, we also saw that the need of the hour was food, food essential items in the community. Daily laborage, uh, laborers, uh, they lost their livelihood. And uh, that was the biggest uh, challenge. And though relief was not our, uh, one of the uh, work that we do, it was not, not our focus area. We have shifted and uh, started relief operations and we have uh, distributed through our partners uh, essentials to few families. And uh, we are adapting our programs too. We are trying to uh, come up with radio programs and also low touch programs that will still create awareness, focusing on the anti-trafficking work we do, not losing the focus, yet adapting to the changing requirements of the society there. Thank you, so The biggest challenge that we see, if you see, is the reverse migration. It would have been a wonderful thing earlier, before Corona. Now we see that all the migrants returning, millions of migrants returning back to the villages, we see them jobless and there are no livelihood opportunity in the villages. So that will definitely boom out to be a big problem uh, soon, very soon. Thank you, Sultan. Thank you for all of your hard work. Um, you know, we really, really uh, appreciate it. Um, Douglas, I want to come to you, to you next before I go on to my second question. Uh, it would be great to get an, a better understanding from you about some of the challenges that you're facing and also like what does your day-to-day -day look like now? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Matt. Um, yeah, on a daily, actually before coronavirus, you know, and then government coming in and 
and putting in some directives such as um, uh, people should wash their hands on a daily basis, or like regularly, and uh, maintaining physical distance. That has been a massive challenge in Madar Islam. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, that has been a massive challenge, especially now. Um, we have actually experienced um, uh, water shortage, which we have never experienced before. So we have gone uh, almost three three weeks without uh, uh, water, which is really uh, important to to ensure that um, uh, you know we maintain the basic hygiene to fight corona. So uh, you know our work is to you know offering uh, safe spaces for. Uh, for young men and women to come and um, either learn, um, engage with other people, learn new skill, and ha that has been massively affected. Uh, you know, you know, we are we are, we are trying as much as possible to ensure that we are we following the government government directive, uh, ensuring that um, uh, we are not uh, we do not have more than five fifteen people you know, in a meeting. So yeah, it has been a massive challenge to to people in Madar Islam. Because you know, again, uh, maintaining that physical distance, it's 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 such a it's it's it's, it's something else. Um, uh, because most of them they normally share bathroom, like 40, 40 family share in, share one bathroom. So you can imagine, um, uh, you know, the the fear uh, that ha has been in you know in so many minds of um, young men and women or even families in in Madar Islam. Thank you, Douglas. I think, you know, it's, it's amazing to really hear about all the different ways that you, you're all sort of responding to the needs of children and young people around the world. And I think, you know, it puts a lot of things for perspective in people like, for people like me, for example, you know, I'm from the UK and, you know, some of the problems we face is, is nothing compared to, you know, what, what you have to deal with in, in your respective countries. And again, you know, I think on behalf of the Global Fund for Children and, you know, I'm, I'm sure I can speak for everyone on this call. We really, really uh, thank you for for all you're doing, but I'm really interested about, you know, about you people, about all of you, like personally, um, you know, what is it that really drives you? What made you sort of, you know, get into the line of work that you're doing? I'm sure you've all had that turning point in your life, you know, where, you know, something sparked and, you know, you thought you're not going to stand up for this no more. You want to be an advocate for the people that you represent. You want to help support your community. And I'm really interested very in very brief, really, to to understand what was that that moment in your in your lives or um, that that made you get there. So, Douglas, if I could start from you this time, what was the, that moment for you? Uh, Douglas, you're you're on mute, so we just have to unmute you. Oh, oh yeah. Sorry. thanks, yeah, <laughs> thanks for that time. Yeah. Um. So I was born and brought up in Matar Islam, and I personally experienced challenges of. Um, of uh, young men and women um, experience while accessing education and opportunities. So, you know, there are days that I, I spend a whole, like uh, almost three, three months, that's a whole time at home as a result of not, get, not having a, a textbook. Um, you know, uh, after I finishing uh, primary school, I, I didn't go to high school directly because my mother couldn't have, afford to take me to high school. So I had to stay for two years, at 14 years, I learned how to shave and, I managed to uh, to save enough to pay a little bit part of my school fees. Went back to high school, so yeah, and th that's how that's how like generally life is in Madar Islam. And majority of young men and women in Madar Islam, they don't get that opportunity to even finish formal education, meaning that they don't have any kind of skill that will help them earn livelihood. So yeah, uh, me growing up in Madar Islam is what really pushed me to, uh, you know, to 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 dive in into this kind of work. Wow, that's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing it, Douglas. And I, I understand that, you know, for many of you to share these stories is very brave as well. So thank you, like, in advance. And, you know, please feel free to sort of not, to, you know, share as, you, as much as you, you like. Uh, Paulina, can I come to you? What was that moment for you in very short? Yeah, for me also, um, growing up, being born and growing up in a border um borderlands like we say i'm from the north of mexico so my family is very tied to the issue of immigration and um when i was about 12 years old my my family moved to california so in a sense i was also an immigrant child that got to experience uh being in another country learning another language um my family moved back to mexico and um 
I studied international relations and my idea when I was in, in university was to uh, help to change the world and maybe uh, to uh, work for the Mexican embassy and things like that. But when, when I moved back to, when I moved to the city of Tijuana, when I arrived here, um, something that really impacted me was seeing the border wall. Even though I grew up near the border, but just coming back to, to the border after being in college, and seeing the wall, and it's something that is very normalized for people at the border, but um, for me, it's also a symbol of injustice because it's a wall that separates many families. So I guess uh, being in Tijuana and meeting many families that are separated by, by the wall and by unfair immigration laws uh, is, what, um, is what drove me to do this work. Thank you very much for sharing that, Paulina. Before I come to Tatiana and to Sudha, I just want to give a quick few shout outs to uh, people who join us from all around the world. We've got um, Sharik who's joining us from India. We've got Mohammed who's joining us from Kenya. Uh, we've got, uh, he, we had Phil from Birmingham. Uh, we've got someone else I just saw from Italy. You know, it's a truly global conversation that we're having here. So thank you all, keep coming in, you know, send us in, in the chat if you haven't told us what city you're calling from. Uh, we want to demonstrate, you know, that we've got a true, uh, truly global experience. Um, and, you know, as I said, our youth leadership councils uh, represents, you know, the United States. We've got Malawi. We've got loads of countries who are being represented. Um, Zimbabwe. We've got so many countries being represented in the youth leadership council. And we want to continue expanding that too. So it's great for us to use this as an opportunity to really connect with lots of different areas which we ordinarily wouldn't be able to. Um, Sutta, can I come to you next, please? Sure, yeah. So uh, after my education and I joined corporates and I've, I've been always volunteering for various social causes along with my parents. Uh, but the turnaround uh, of uh, coming into the social sector came into uh, picture when uh, after completing 15 years of a corporate tech, uh, career and uh, I felt it was my turn to now do my bit for the society and it was the right time. And I was looking for opportunities and uh, I've got one in the education sector and uh, one in my choices foundation, which was dealing with uh, sex trafficking. And uh, when I read through about it, I understood the difficulties the girls were facing through. Uh, and uh, so I thought if I not, I'm not able to push myself to do something uh, different, I can't expect the world to change. So I came into my choices foundation and I'm really thankful that I came in here and do my bit for the society. Wow. Thank you very much for sharing that, Sudha. And, you know, hats off to you for all you do and really appreciate your bravery and everything you do in society. Uh, Tatiana, I want to come to you finally before we go on to the next question. What was that moment for you? Yes. Um, you know, I'm not here by accident. And uh, I'm so grateful, you know, to have the honor and privilege to work for the society. Being a young girl, I was so overwhelmed by, uh, by injustice. And I knew that to be a small little girl, you can, a little, absolutely little unprotected girl, uh, it is un, um, like, you, you can be so happy that you know someone can teach you how to overcome a difficult overcome difficult situation how to learn and how to how to raise so um uh, this why i uh, decided and i'm absolutely happy that uh, only being in the community and only working with the young people you can uh, you can together with them change their life and learn how you can work together Wow. Yeah. Again, you know, like, it's just, you're all very, very impressive in terms of your, you know, your, your stories and what driven you, what dr drives you to do what you do. And, you know, it really puts things into perspective for, for people like me, um, in, being brought up in, in London. I um, just want to give a massive shout out to everyone who's joining us. We've got Amina from Kenya. We've got Camille from, who's calling us from, uh, Miami, uh, who's just into, is a Venezuelan student there. Uh, we've got people calling in. We've got Emmy from uh, Uganda. We've got Aziz from France. Uh, Sava, uh, I can speak a bit of French. <laughs> uh, we've got Madri from uh, South Africa. We've got uh, Molly, who's calling from Park City in the USA. Um, 
truly global conversation. We've got Alex from Londoner, my fellow Londoner. Hey to you. Um, but yeah, let's keep the, the conversation going. So, I mean, look, it's been really great hearing about how you've all sort of, um, what, what really drives you to do what you do and how you've essentially responded to, to what you're doing. Um, if I can start, it's actually Tatiana with you. Uh, there's a question that's coming to us from one of our, um, from one of our participants um, who's asking us about, you know, how people are traveling from cities uh, to, out to rural communities um, and the big question around employment. Um, have you had like cases around this, you know, what has been sort of the, you know, have you seen people being impacted from sort of the impact of like, because of the job losses around coronavirus and how has it impacted people from rural communities? Yes, you know, I can hear, I can tell you more that uh, we even we do not realize how impacted we are for the short time and for the lo lo for the short time and long time, long term, you know, because a lot of people lost their jobs. Um, and we know a lot of cases that uh, parents uh, are obliged to stay home. Uh, they do not have an uh, opportunity to um, continue, for, for example, their small businesses. Um, they are uh, to sell their uh, products for their s absolutely small farm, uh, f farms. As you, uh, maybe um, you know that the uh, Republic of Moldova is the small rural country and 61% uh, uh, of our um, residents reside in rural areas. Mm -hmm. And it is absolutely, um, um, you know, crucial for the people to have the opportunity to develop their small uh, small businesses and absolutely in our time in in big big town um people are affected by um by lost also from small entrepreneurial areas they uh, uh they lost their jobs they uh, were obliged to close their businesses and they cannot um continue they uh, they they cannot sell their products yeah, it's, it's, it's really um, tough to hear, like, so, as you say, you know, what's happening, particularly, you know, I think, you know, stories in, in rural communities often sort of go, you know, missed. A lot of people always, you know, tend to focus on the big cities uh, in yes. this regard. So I think that's the, the challenge, which is why, um, you know, it's really important. Guys, keep your questions coming in. Uh, we've got some questions coming in from the Q&A. Um, again, please raise your hand. I'm going to be coming to people in audience sh soon as well. Don't worry about the order. Zoom automatically does that for us already. So you're not going to be cheated from the order. So if you raise your hand, you will come to you as soon as we come in order. Uh, you can also chat your, um, type your question into the chat function. Better to do it via the, um, the Q&A function. Either way, it doesn't matter. We're, we're monitoring them and we're going to get back in touch with you. And also make sure that you're involved in the conversation on Twitter too. So you can, it's at global for children That's the number four. So global for children uh, be part of the conversation. Um, Paulina, I want to come to, actually, just before I come to Paulina, I guess, you know, there's been a lot of talk about how we've been responding to, to the, uh, to the, to the crisis, um, that we we face now. Um, and one of the ways is, is, you know, how many of GFC's partners are finding it both effective and creative ways to respond to, to the needs of the communities during the COVID-19. And Douglas, can you talk about a bit about the digital tool, that Oasis Mabare recently created? Yeah, sure. Um, after we received the, our first case uh, of COVID-19, uh, um, all learning institutions were closed. And, uh, you know, government um, uh, started um, encouraging people to learn online. Um, and they're available, they're, they're, you know, the learning model, which is available online, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great tool. But um, families in Matar Islam and those living in informal settlements and rural areas um, are finding it difficult to access the content online as a result of uh, not, uh, them not having a, uh, you know, uh, access to internet uh, or even having just a smartphone that will enable them to access, um, access uh, the information. So we, we developed um, uh, a, USS, a USSD SMS tool that enables each, each and everyone to access the learning platform. As long as you have a phone, it doesn't matter if it's a smartphone or a feature phone, you can access the learning content. 
So if that, the, your phone can send and receive text, you're good to go. So um, the system does a couple of things, three of them. Uh, I'll just go quickly and mention them. So the first bit is uh, it sensitizes the community about COVID. So what the system does is that he, community can participate and actually it's for free, for, uh, community can participate in quizzes, engage their level of information about coronavirus. Uh, two is uh, we are targeting uh, those who are in uh, class four, grade four to class eight um, uh, with um, sciences, that is math, social, social studies, and science, um, they, can, they, can, they can be able to, to access learning content at the core front of their home. And they, um, the system is, we are, we, are, we are currently working on algorithm to ensure that um, uh, it, it, it helps kids to learn uh, and build, uh, build um, uh, they, you know, encourage them and build, maybe for example, such a, a, such a topic they're not good at. So the system will automatically detect um, from answering the question that they have, um, you know, those questions that they have engaged with. And then the last bit, um, uh, because we, we, you know, we in Kenya we have experienced uh, a massive influx of, uh, you know, there are guys coming in and, and doing donation, which is such an amazing, but uh, uh, you can expose yourself while, uh, while distributing food or they can expose you. So the last bit is um, uh, we are giving digital voucher, which can be redeemed using mobile money. So we, uh, after a kid does several quizzes, we send them um, a digital voucher. And the aim of the digital voucher is to ensure that parents are, are participating in, in kids' learning. Uh, and then uh, after they, you know, they're, they're participating in quizzes, uh, they get a digital voucher, go to, for, go to any shop and act and buy what they would like to buy. Yeah. Amazing, I mean, you know, the thing, one of the things that amazes me about all four of you actually is, is the fact that, you know, it's just, it's just, I guess, you know, like what you're responding to, the way in which you're responding, which we're gonna hear a bit more about from our other partners too. Um, one of the things that really amazes me about all of you is, is that, you know, no matter what situation that you're put in, I guess your passion and your drive for your cause will, will enable you to find new ways in, in supporting people. and. You know, I think from Douglas, what you're doing with, you know, in, te in terms of using technology and tech to, to better support your community, I think it's a, it's a great example um, of that. So, Ty, I want to come to you next. Um, we've got a question about what impact on child trafficking um, you're seeing from the crisis and are levels increasing or decreasing? It's a known fact that uh, child trafficking increases after every disaster. So uh, it was said that the traffickers are so active that they reach the villages or the source areas even before the authorities, uh, who the police and the government authorities, right? Uh, so the vulnerability increases during any such pandemic, and uh, this case, this situation wouldn't be different. Uh, it might even be larger this time uh, because of loss of employment of the families of migrant laborers returning back. Uh, and the uncertainty uh, of whether they'll get into the get any livelihood opportunities soon uh, makes them all vulnerable. And uh, though we haven't had any research or uh, statistics to show that it's increased, it's just been two months. Uh, there are indications from previous uh, history that definitely we'll see an increase. And uh, we've done a small survey uh, through our partners. Uh, around 550 villages responded, and uh, there are missing cases that have been reported from few of the villages, which directly correlates with uh, uh, the trafficking. Usually the trafficking cases are not logged in as uh, trafficking cases, but are, as fi are filed as missing cases. So that's a direct correlation that we've been seeing. Yeah. yeah, nice. I mean, it's just, it just makes you wonder, right? Like, you know, how on earth do we have like human beings like in this, in this world, which uh, can carry out such, you know, nasty and you know it's just it, it makes you feel embarrassed to be a human being when you hear about uh, things like this um, but you know luckily we have people like you uh, who's working on the ground to make sure that we're supporting all those people that um, who desperately need it um paulina i want to come to you next uh, we have another question uh, which is about how can we help children in refugee camps um, and I, I guess you know like you obviously uh, you have shelters and that you provide 
for young migrants at the border of uh, Tijuana. Um, so it'd be great to hear a bit about that and your sort of experience. Thank you. Um, so yes, in the city of Tijuana, we have about 24 shelters. So we are one of the cities that has the most shelters in the U.S.-Mexico border. However, all along the U.S.-Mexico border, um, there are thousands of families. Uh, like I mentioned, the northern cities of Mexico have become like a huge waiting room. So uh, some families were able to be in shelters, but many others are waiting in refugee camps. And now with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, this means that they, their health and their livelihood is in a threat. Because uh, in, in the shelters, for example, um, it's very hard for us to ensure that people can be socially distanced. Um, for example, in our case, we have capacity for 40 people, but some shelters have hundreds of people. And uh, in camps, um, the situation is even worse because they they are out in the open in tents, so the situation is very difficult right now. Um, one problem that we've had uh, with the closing of the U.S.-Mexico border is that we depended a lot on donations and volunteers that came from California or from the U.S. Uh, and now with the closing of the border, we have stopped receiving a, a lot of donations. Uh, many allies and many um, people in the U.S. that still want to support have asked us, how can we help? So I think uh, the best thing would be to donate directly to local organizations. I think the biggest needs are housing and food um, and to ensure that, that children and young people can have a safe space and while they face this uh, scary pandemic and that uh, we can ensure that their health um, is taken care of. But also, um, besides these needs, I think another very important issue and that Douglas also mentioned is education. And for example, uh, one thing that we are happy about is that uh, we recently um, got into a partnership with the uh, US Policy Immigration Center from the University of California in San Diego. And they helped us um, to get a donation also through UNHRC for, to create a computer lab. So we received a donation of uh, 24 computers and, and now we're working with volunteers that are uh, working long distance, providing computer classes for the children at the shelter. So I think, um, I think despite all the borders, physical and other type of borders that are being um, strengthened at these times, there are other ways through technology and education that we can be connected and keep supporting these communities. So I would say, of course, direct donations, but also uh, investing in education and technology opportunities for these children and young people. Wow, amazing. That's really, really great to hear um, about all the work. And it's really good. I mean, again, it's just great to hear about all the specific examples of how you're all responding. Um, I just want to quick give a quick disclaimer to the to the audience. Um, if you see me time to time um, itching my eyes or crying or my voice is getting a bit um, unclear, and it's because I'm suffering from really bad hay fever, and that's why my face is swollen. So uh, please bear with me uh, whilst you see that. It's not because I'm crying, <laughs> um, but uh, as heartwarming as the um, as the sort of the accounts are from our panelists. And um, Tatiana, I want to ask about your views. Um, we've got a question about you know, specifically looking at uh, COVID with, I guess, with a gender lens. Um, what kind of gender disparities are you seeing in your community? You know, um, we do not have so evident um, gender disparity in our community. Uh, we, um, like, run a lot of programs which can help our young people to um, accept each other um, but what we continue to do and it is extremely important uh, to prevent um, every uh, like intention to promote gender disparity it is to run um, special holistic programs which will help young people to accept each other as a woman, as a man, 
as uh, human beings will equal rights. So um, uh, this is a base of our programs and uh, we are working with, I, I, have, I think, our experience with Global Fund for Children. We are honored to work with Global Fund for Children for ten, uh, more than 10 years now. And um, you know uh, that uh, it is uh, like base of uh, our uh, approach on um, uh, on, in the rural area of our programs, it is to respond uh, with hol holistic uh, approach and programs, which will um, bring people together, bring young people together. They will uh, um, like accept each other from uh, from their young days, and they will grow with um, uh, strong. Um, like um, accept, uh, uh, acceptance. Mm. No, thank you, thank you, Tatiana. I think that's a, it's really important for us to understand, you know, what some of those um, disparities are, and you know, sometimes you know they're very like can, can vary from different regions and different cultures, and I think it's important for all of us to to, to make sure that we're taking the time to reflect. Um, on those to, to, to update our sort of uh, knowledge around those issues as well. Um, I just want to say we're approaching the last 20 minutes, 19 minutes actually, in fact, of the, the global webinar. Um, what I really want to do is I want to encourage uh, all of the participants uh, who are on the call today uh, to speak. Um, so if you would like to ask a question or if you'd like to make a comment about yourself or you'd like to talk about, a bit about what you're up to, um, just raise your hand and we're going to come to you. So I've got a couple more questions that I want to ask. Um, before I do that, I want, I want to make sure that I do come to you as well. Um, I just want to touch upon the, the mental health aspect of uh, COVID-19. Uh, we know, of course, you know, like especially in relation to young people, there's been a lot, uh, particularly in my line of work uh, with what I do in the UK, um, how young people have been affected with their mental health. Um, sort of Douglas, I mean, either one of you, um, you know, what experiences do you have? I guess sort of I'll come to you first this time you know, around how the whole sort of pandemic has impacted uh, young people's mental health? Uh, big challenge, actually. Uh, most of the schools and education institutions are stay, uh, shut down now. And uh, uh, they are staying, the adolescents and the parents, everyone stays in confinement. Okay, and uh, there are uh, abusive parents, abusive relatives, and uh, child abuse has... Uh, increased according to the reports and uh, the 1098 the child life uh, helpline received 92,000 cases reports uh, in span of 11 days the first 11 days of lockdown so it has been an immense increase in that that is uh, one challenge faced, uh, faced by the children especially young girls and uh, 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 coming to the challenges of the youth education uh, uh, the bleak outlook and the prospect the job prospects these are taking toll, I think, uh, amongst the uh, younger generation, adolescents especially. The uncertainty of uh, whether the schools and education institutions will reopen anytime sooner, the loss of uh, academic year, uh, that's one big challenge. And uh, uh, online classes have been started by government, even on TV uh, classes are being aired. But uh, there are many who have no access either to the smartphone or to the television. So they are losing out in learning and uh, uh, abuse is one thing and school, uh, children with special needs uh, are also impacted, uh, highly impacted you can say, uh, especially children with autism etc. They are used to specific routine and for them a big change in the routine, change again in confined and not able to go out for walk also is uh, becoming a challenge. and. Uh, I think parents have to cope up uh, and not uh, parents themselves are anxious about what future holds for them and uh, that anxiousness probably is transferring also to the kids uh, both with the special needs and to the other young adolescents so uh, I think that the need of the hour is now to understand take it take things day by day and probably work on calming yourself so that the children can deal with the anxiousness better sure yeah yeah and uh, another one, in one more thing I wanted to point out is the cyber abuse. This uh, online grooming and sexual exploitation mm -hmm. is growing now. With more and more people working from home and having more time in their hands, the demand for online pornography has been increasing. 
and uh, similarly uh, online grooming in terms of live entertainment uh, by young girls and all has been growing also uh, that has been increasing even before the pandemic i think this has uh, put in a more fuel to the problem yeah i mean it's it's i think you know it's it's really important and the reason why i guess i mentioned that question and just how thank you for for your answer is because you know ultimately i think uh, you know like you know young people in many ways have been forgotten from the conversation you know um you know in many ways i understand because there are many vulnerable groups in our society which probably come first but you know ultimately young people will probably have to live with the the sort of the subsequent sort of consequences from the you know the economic downturn that's been created and you know the job opportunities that have been lost you know the the, the families torn apart you know all of these things that we're hearing from you guys you know i think you know young people are going to have to live with the outcome the impact of covid-19 and you know, we know this isn't going to be something that's going to be like a year or two this is going to be you know potentially something that's going to impact uh, generations um so yeah thank you for your response now i want to go over to our, our guests uh, which is i guess the the most exciting part for me um and it's a very challenging part but we we're joined by Benny so i'm just going to ask Benny if you can just quickly uh, tell us where you're calling from and what question and who you're directing your question to please Benny or or yeah hi uh, yeah this is Benny here from india hyderabad uh, uh, i think suda has uh, mam suda has very clearly spoke about india's situation okay uh, uh one one important point you know i want to make is i'm a, i'm basically a consultant for two big in, you know, international organizations in india who are into you know child projects okay on you know, children trafficking and you know other other projects so um, uh, the biggest challenge which i see here is in fact india is a place where you know uh, family they are known to the family basically they, they spend more time with family you know they they love to spend time with the family and you no know, very sadly that you know during lockdown when entire family was with you know with together you no know, there were several cases which have been registered against you know child abuse one very important thing we need to observe that you know children are there family members parents are there and you know entire you know basically joint families are built there but there's a big big you know a huge cases which were been registered that you know child abuse by parents by uncles you know you no know, unclose relatives itself that's something uh, which we need to th- uh, look at it is one that important thing is second thing is i run a school uh, for children basically you know uh, single parent children and you know tribes tribal children uh, one one very big uh, problem which we face is that you know children when they start growing up you know when they when they reach an age of 10 or 12 when they are studying then we see their relatives or you know a single parent coming back and taking them away from from the schools or from the hostel and putting them to work yeah. which is again child labor we are trying to solve that problem again we we face such kind of a challenge you know i just wanted to you know ask you people if you can help me out you no know. yeah Uh, Benny thank you for your for your remarks um we're going to uh put put it to our uh, sort of uh, panelists in a second we're also joined by also uh Chintala Pudi as well um so i'm going to ask our host yeah, great we're joined uh please introduce yourself where you're calling from and what your question is and if you could be very brief please um with your question and remarks uh can you hear us okay can we can you is on mute yeah you, you seem muted um okay maybe we we haven't problems are uh, connected um yeah we'll come back to them we'll come back to come back to them at the end um, i just want to also take this opportunity to say that we're also joined by our members of the youth leadership council uh towards the end of this call um, i'm going to bring them on the screen as well so you'll get to meet uh, some of them today uh, we're joined by um antonina nazra from the uk antonina from poland I've got Sunga on the line, we've got Katie from the USA and I'll give a shout out to the rest as well but you you have an opportunity to to meet with them uh, all today as well. Um I mean I guess obviously we've had we've had from Benny about you know some of his questions but I just wanted to sort of just bring us back to to the focus of this um of this webinar because I'm conscious of of the time um 
and you know I, part of this the, the purpose is really to understand you know how your organization has responded and how you've so sort of what you've done to, to sort of adapt um in terms of you know you we, we will obviously talk about financial support and everything but what are the other ways in which sort of what if you if you were to sort of speak to the attendees or speak to the global fund for children uh, what are some of the practical ways in which we can sort of support you beyond sort of just uh the financial means and Tatiana maybe I'll come to you first this time yeah and thank you uh, this is very interesting and important question because so uh, besides of um, financial uh, supporting it is very important how um, how do we invest in our abilities and knowledges because COVID and uh, all effects created by COVID um affected us too because you know no one knows everything right it is very important how do you understand what exactly we should learn to answer to the people needs and to come to the people with you know this exactly simple simple uh programs which can um, be developed in rural areas and can absolutely help and integrate uh young people and uh, children and to help them to uh, like run their own life yeah. and um, so this is a, in, a continuous investment in uh, um, like logistical support and uh, knowledge support and what is very important also in our partnership with Global Fund for Children it is uh, like uh, how Global Fund for Children support us as a team and how they um, um help us to grow um our own selves you know like individuals like a persons i'm sure i i i left myself on mute there for a second uh, thank you tatiana um yeah and I, I think yeah you know it's really important for us to understand you know as i guess you know from the youth leadership council's perspective uh you know what, what are some of the things that we can be advocating um, on your behalf beyond sort of just the, the financial support that you know GFC very kindly sort of provides. Douglas I want to come to you next because obviously you spoke a lot about the the technology aspect and, and sort of the work that you're doing you know do you have any ideas about you know what, what would you like to see us do more in supporting you beyond sort of the, the financial means and what course of action would you I guess put out to, to the audience today? Yeah um, I'll talk about a couple of things one um, you know when we when we got our, our first case, uh, all of us were worried. So especially me, I was super worried because I didn't know what's going to happen. And uh, you know, living in this in this informal settlement, I was I didn't know uh, the future, what the future hold for us. And I'm I'm really grateful for uh, for GFC uh, good intention, like uh, because I had a couple of um, uh, you know call with uh, Alex and then Bundy. Uh, and assuring us that um, you know they they are going to they are, they are, they are there for us and if we if uh, if we want to vent we can we can go ahead and and and, and you know reach out to them uh, share our frustration and um, and actually after having a series of um, uh, conversation with them I I can say I can definitely say that we we came out really strongly knowing that um, uh, we have someone uh, in you know thinking about us and. And they have a good intention about uh, our well-being because it's one thing you not uh, you know uh, us who are at for a forefront um, we need we also need to to be at our best uh, and that was really that was really good and another thing is um uh, ensure uh, solidifying the safe space that we have amongst all the grantees uh, because we have had a really uh, good connection with uh, our local, you know, the local grantee that is uh, Crime Sipoa, who are doing fantastic job, especially now. And we have had a, a really amazing conversation on how uh, on how to collaborate. Um, so if uh, if you guys you can really like uh, make it, uh, uh, you can you can make it come it, you know, you can solidify it and ensure that. Um, uh, all grantees have a safe space to to collaborate, share, and uh, uh, that would be really amazing thing. Yeah, I think you know if I could just, I guess you know, like thank you, Douglas, and I know that the the GFC team uh, is all here listening uh, into the calls. I know we've got the CEO John Hecklinger as well. Uh, we've got people from all over uh, working for GFC. So 
I'm sure they're listening to this and uh, you know they're very sort of engaged in, in this. So hopefully we can definitely follow up with that. Uh, we've got six minutes left, so I, I've got two final comments that I want to get in. Uh, we're gonna we still got the outcome of the poll, and I still want to introduce the Youth Leadership Council me, uh, members. If I could do that all in six minutes, I'm going to be very happy and probably I should stop talking right now. Uh, Pauline, I want to come to you next. Uh, just very briefly, um, how can we uh, better support you beyond financially? And any last comments, please. Thank you. Um, so in Espacio Migrantes team, uh, since the month of March, we have been working mostly from home. So one thing that we want to do is use this time for uh, training and for, to educate ourselves. Especially right now, uh, one, one subject that we're interested in, in learning more about is racial injustice because uh, we're right next to San Diego and we're seeing the Black Lives Matter movement. But at the same time, we, we see that in Tijuana and in Mexico, um, indigenous and black migrants are also um, racially discriminated, are, are also suffering violence and are being the most impacted by COVID-19. So we are trying to find resources, especially available in Spanish, because mm -hmm. we've seen that there's not a lot of these materials in Spanish. And we think that it's an opportunity for us to learn. And another thing is that um, we are also applying a survey to immigrant uh, young people and families to see the impacts of COVID-19. And one thing that we want to do is to be able to write a report about this so that we can do advocacy work. I think that one way that uh, donors can support us um, is by helping us to amplify our voice and helping us find resources so that we can let the world know what is happening here and push for advocacy because I think that COVID-19 has only amplified all these inequalities and problems. And right now we can use this time to, uh, to push for change, uh, not only for COVID-19, but in general. It, it's uh, the time for, to push for change right now. Paulina, thank you so much. If I could just say, you've got four minutes. If you can find that survey, um, if you've got a link for it, feel free to, to drop it into the to, to link to the attendees so people can uh, have a look at it. Um, I just want to bring up the, the results of the poll. Uh, so here we go. So we've got... Uh, well, 39% um, education tops the poll about what worries uh, more for children and young people, 20% uh, physical well-being, 16% uh, about mental health, uh, child abuse at 14%. So, you know, a lot of the issues that we have spoken about, um, I guess, you know, has, has obviously been uh, sort of, uh, thank you, uh, Maria, for bringing that up uh, to us. Um, Sutta, just very, very briefly, just very briefly, in 30 seconds, does the poll result surprise you or are you, is that what you expected? Uh, so it doesn't surprise me. I think because the challenges differ nation to nation, India is a complex country. So child marriage is specific to some areas. So it doesn't surprise me. Great. Thank you so much. You know, I mean, look, Paulina, I just want to pick up on your last comments as well about, you know, about the, the Black Lives Matter movement. And I think, you know, for us is. uh, is it, you know, like, unfortunately, as I said at the start, it's a really, um, <laughs> words can't, I, I don't even know what words to use anymore. You know, the fact that we have to keep having this conversation um, every sort of, every so, so frequently, um, you know, but it's so important for us to use this as a moment to, to really use it as a catalyst for change. And, you know, we, what we don't want is to sort of, for all this enthusiasm and sort of to just die off and, you know, we have to come back to this. So, um, yeah, let's definitely use this, uh, this, this positive energy that's coming out of it to really uh, to share our activism around the world and, you know, really push and support um, each other. Uh, without further ado, I do want to bring on sort of the YLC uh, members. So if attendees could just bear with us for a couple of seconds um, whilst they're coming on. So you'll see them slowly start popping up on the screen, um, hopefully soon. <laughs> Here we go. So we've got, uh, that's not Sunga, that's, uh, that's Nazra, actually. Uh, <laughs> hey. I'm not sure why the name popped up as uh, the Sunga there. We've got a Katie who's joining us from the US. Oh, wow, amazing. We've got Antonina who's joining us from Poland. <laughs> and I believe we've also got the real Sunga who's also on the call as well. Yeah, I'm here. My old, I think you can hear me. 
Not to okay, yeah, we can hear you. So there you go. Okay. So these are guys. We've got we've got more members. Well. We've got Solomon. We've got um, we've got Wiener. We've got uh, Saro as well. Uh, but you know, I really wanted to to sort of to bring in the youth leadership council members. Nazra, Katie, Antonina, Sunga, is there anything you would like to say about today? Uh, Nazra, maybe we start from you. Um, I just want to say thank you to all the panellists. Um, it's been really insightful to hear what's happening around the world. Um, I think it really hit with me about um, just kind of like how, um, like near Mexico, how, and in Mexico, how black um, indigenous people are being treated because it's very close to home, you know, just, I think it's just, interesting to hear what all of you have to say and just thank you so much uh katie thank you so much nazra and that's by the way nazra is our, our vice chair and she's joining us from bristol uh, in the uk katie black lives matter and happy pride month everyone yeah they're very <laughs> important we should definitely not forget that um you know right now we'll be out there celebrating and the diversity um but unfortunately obviously the situation and hopefully we can get back to it very soon um, as life returns back to normal. Uh, Antonina, joining us from Poland. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, everyone, for your insights, for your expertise, for, for what you're doing here. And I wanted to thank everyone involved with what's going on in the US and thank everyone who is currently supporting the queer community around the world because they are, these are crazy times and we need you and we need us and we need this community. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you very much, Antonia. And finally, we've got Sunga, so you'll be able to hear her. Yeah. Uh, hi. Hi. I also just want to say thank you. It's been amazing learning what is going on in different places. And as someone who's very passionate about education and empowerment, it was very refreshing to see people bring that up as uh, something that all of you are working on. So just thank you so much for taking the time. And thank you for everyone who joined. This has been amazing. Thank you. Okay, don't leave the call yet. Uh, what we want to do is just do a quick uh, uh, picture of all of us just looking at the screen and smiling firstly. So um, just smile to the screen. I'm sure there'll be a picture taken uh, in a second. Um, yeah. And then let's also do a big wave. And a screenshot there. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining the our first essentially um, global webinar uh, on understanding the impact of COVID-19 on children and young people. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you to the Global Fund for Children team, Maria, and the communications team for all of your support in making sure that we're putting off this fantastic event. Thank you so much to, um, you know, our Youth Leadership Council. Um, and just really to say, you know, as a call to actions, you know, don't forget, you know, the Global Fund for Children has launched a, a COVID-19 fund, a response fund, uh, we've funded hundreds of thousands um, across the UK. Uh, so please make sure that you do donate. We had a, a match giving um, a, a fund which, we've uh, which we were able to raise thousands of pounds. Um, so if we're able to do that, um, I'm sure we're going to be putting it out on the follow-up email. Um, also subscribe to our YouTube, our Facebook, uh, our Twitter. Um, I hope I haven't missed out anything. Otherwise, I'll get in trouble from the <laughs> GFC team. Uh, thank you so much for all of your time. And, you know, as I said, just the end, you know, let's use the positivity and the, the, the energy that's coming out of the Black Lives Matter movement and make sure that, you know, we're using that energy and, you know, make sure that we actually make, use that as a catalyst for change. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have, hope you have a lovely, uh, great rest of your day wherever you are in the world. And see you soon.